Welcome to Encounter Grace, where we come face to face with God's work in the world for our good. Join host Jason McKnight as we explore practical issues of community, theology, and leadership in everyday life. Welcome to another episode of Encounter Grace. My name is Ben Hendricks, and today I'm here with Jason McKnight, and we're going to cover a a little bit of a hard topic, a hot topic, but Mm -hmm. something that I think every thinking Christian needs to know and needs to be thinking about right now because it's right here in front of us, the Equality Act. And so here's the problem. Right now, we have so many differences of opinions of what this thing is and what it means for us. All the way on one side of some writers have said that the Equality Act is a decree of liberation. Hmm a voice of freedom, both making it clear that their stance is that this is needed and helpful. Mm -hmm. But then on the other end, we have guys like Andrew Walker, an associate professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, who said this, that the bill represents the most invasive threat to religious liberty ever proposed in America, given that it touches areas of education, public accommodation, employment, and federal funding. Were it, to pass, were it to pass sweeping effects on religious liberty, free speech, and freedom of conscience would be both historic and also chilling. Hmm. Very clearly, two major opposing views. Right. So, Jason, how are we hmm. to navigate the Equality Act? What are we even to think of it? And primarily... What, what actually is it? Yeah, no, that's good. Let's let's do that. And I, that's what I love about this podcast is we do thinking Christian stuff. We're we're not afraid to tackle stuff, and we're not setting up straw men. Yeah. But what you have given us uh, just in that intro is two things really diametrically opposed. Is it the liberation, or is it going to have a chilling effect? And mm. where are we? How are we supposed to think about it? Well, what is it specifically? Let's start there. Um, so the equality, the so-called Equality Act is legislation that's already passed the House, and its proponents say it's designed to protect the LGBTQ community from discrimination and oppression on a nationwide status. And what it does is it takes the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it changes the wording and expands the formal definition about what it's illegal to discriminate about. So in Section 201 of the Civil Rights Act, 1964, uh, it says this, and I'm just going to take out a few of the words, but you're going you're gonna to hear. And, and here's what it says. All persons shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of any place of public accommodation without discrimination or segregation on the ground of race, color, religion, or national origin. And what the Equality Act would do would insert into that list of things, and it would now say on the ground of, you know, no discrimination or segregation on the ground of race, color, religion, sex, and then open bracket, including sexual orientation and gender identity, close bracket, or national origin. So mm. inserting yet another thing. So it would be, it would provide specific and explicit protection from all discrimination for gay men, lesbian women, transgender, bisexual, queer folk, and for women. Women. Hmm. Okay. Who on earth could possibly be provide, <laughs> could be against providing protection for a vulnerable and oppressed group or groups? So this is what we've got to wrestle with, because this is really a big deal here. And the interesting thing, you know, the first rule of politics after follow the money, <laughs> the first rule of politics is this. Whoever sets the terms wins, wins the debate. Hmm. And really, the way, they're, the way the proponents of it are saying, uh, here's what it is. If you're not for the Equality Act, you must not care about discrimination. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm sure that, like, very clearly, everyone who's listening to this would not be in that category. Like, there are people who do care. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so, absolutely. And so not to try to fall into that... How do we start helping thinking Christians think carefully about this? Like, can we examine the background of the act and and I guess whatever, maybe problems along the way that you see in Mm -hmm. that, like just help Mm -hmm. us think that through? Yeah. Well, okay. So I've had a lot of fun really thinking over the last two years, actually. I started thinking about this about a year and a half or two years ago. And then over the last several weeks, as it's come back now for the fourth time in the House, first two times died in committee. Last Congress, it passed in the House, did not pass the Senate, and now we're back here on the same treadmill. So it seems like we, mm. if it doesn't pass this time, we're going to see it a fifth time, a sixth time, a seventh time. You know, it just seems that. What is the act itself saying? 
So the very first line, the main function of this act is here, to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, and for other purposes, which is just an interesting four words added on <laughs> to the purpose of this thing. Like all of a sudden, just this catch-all. And for other purposes, we're gonna pass this law for other purposes. <laughs> But really, they're saying discrim we don't want there to be any discrimination on the basis of sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And the vehicle they're using is taking the Civil Rights Act and saying, we're part of this and let's insert into the Civil Rights Act from 1964 a new category of people that we have to specifically protect hmm. from discrimination, which they're facing all over the place. So the act passed in the House, it's HR 1, or it's HR 5, and it, uh, it starts with a section called Findings and Purpose. So there, what I just read was just really basically the, the title, <laughs> but now there's 23 paragraphs of findings, really the rationale for this legislation. They lay out their case uh, as to why we're passing this legislation and why it's needed now. We're not going to read all the 23, but I got to read a couple of them. Is this, is this the part of for all, for all, the, all of those other purposes? Like, yeah. Yeah, that's why it's so long. <laughs> well, you might see. <laughs> so the very first thing it says is discrimination can occur on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, on the basis of pregnancy or childbirth or a related medical condition of an individual, as well as because of sex-based stereotypes. I'm still quoting. Each of these factors alone can serve as the basis for discrimination, and each is a form of sex discrimination. That's the legislation's opening paragraph. It casts the widest possible net. Hmm. And it has a view, uh, it views a power position that invites us to see discriminatory acts everywhere. It basically urges people to look for discriminatory acts everywhere, hmm. even in someone's medical condition. Now, Okay, well, let's keep reading. Yeah. Number two, this is paragraph number two. Sing, a, a single instance of discrimination may have more than one basis. For example, discrimination against a married same-sex couple could be based on a sex stereotype that marriage should only be between heterosexual couples, <laughs> could be based on the sexual orientation of the two individuals in the couple, or it could be based on both. In addition, some persons are subjected to discrimination based on a combination or the intersection of multiple protected characteristics. And here they give an example. Discrimination against a pregnant lesbian could be based on her sex, because she's a woman, her sexual orientation, because she's a lesbian, or pregnancy, or on the basis of multiple factors. I mean, are you confused? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is, this, but here's the deal. This paragraph, number two in the Equality Act, H.R. 5, passed the House. This paragraph, we see the framework of intersectionality, which is yeah. this idea that the more places your experience intersects with oppressed identifiers, the more protection you need. And so a lesbian pregnant woman has three points of intersection with her oppressiveness and we need to do something special as a Congress, as a culture, as a person. It's intersectionality is based in large part on a social thought called critical race theory. And we maybe you've heard a lot about this or maybe you haven't heard much about it. Uh, it's in my mind, in my reading of it, is, is a tenuous construct. It's not that helpful at all. Um, mm. There are parts of it, a few parts of it that are, but as we're seeing it today, it's singularly unhelpful. And you can trace it back to the Frankfurt School in the 30s in Germany or to Marxist doctrine. Now, either way, I'm not sure you want to build a legal framework on Germany in the 30s or on Marxism at any time. Probably don't need a podcast on why that's probably true. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. But, and I'm not laughing at someone who's hurt. I'm just saying, yeah. this is silly. Yeah. This is silly. And I don't know if you caught that in paragraph number two that I just read, <laughs> that um, some people may be discriminated, a, a same-sex couple, because uh, a sex oh, stereotype that marriage should only that's be... That's exactly what I laughed at, yeah. I mean, seriously. A well, sex uh, stereotype? 5,000 <laughs> years of Judeo-Christian thinking. I mean, just thrown out the window as, as a sex stereotype in, a, in, a, in one paragraph, in an instant? It's that's not hard. helpful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not good... 
writing or careful writing in terms of legislation that and, you're, you're wanting to pass. And I think that's the rub for me is, I mean, as someone who, who again, doesn't want to be just ingen- like disingenuous to people who are hurting, who, who right. might really like be right. oppressed. But yeah. some, of these, some of the wording to this, it's just difficult like to read and go, and it's hard mm-hmm. to affirm that. Yeah, it, it really is. We're not going to, I'm going to read maybe just two more because I think there's two more that are, that are interesting for us. All 23 of them are fascinating. (laughs) Um, But paragraphs three and four, we're going to skip over, but they lay out cases where discrimination is possible or might have occurred. Okay. Paragraph five, actually, then they back down. Okay. Now watch this. Many employers already continue to, already and continue to take proactive steps beyond those required by some states and localities to ensure they're fostering positive and respectful cultures for all employees. Many, pub- many places of public accommodation also recognize the economic imperative to offer goods and services to as many consumers as possible. What's being said there? Well, there's already many businesses where there's no whit of discrimination and is respectful for all people. Well, this is good news. I mean, honestly, yeah. almost every boss I know, I know a lot of business owners, they fall into this. Hmm. They're not discriminating. Um, apparently, things aren't as bad as the first four paragraphs would have you believe. <laughs> In fact, paragraph five that I just read also recognizes that the free market betters things for people because businesses thrive when they're sensitive to the needs of their customer base and they expand that customer base. Hmm. Interestingly, I mean... Don't tell the Marxists, but free market sorts some things out. (laughs) It's not perfect, but it sorts a lot of things out. Let me go to one more, because this actually, I mean, we could do the section they have on adoption uh, that we could do several others, but let's, let's look at this. Paragraph seven, again, we're in the findings, why we need this legislation. And here's why we need this national legislation to add on to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Here's why, paragraph seven, Yet another reason, the discredited practice known as quote unquote conversion therapy is a form of discrimination that harms LGBTQ people by undermining individuals' sense of self-worth and increasing suicide ideation and substance abuse, exacerbating family conflict and contributing to second class status. Those are some claims. Those are some very big claims. And in any family conflict or substance abuse way or, um, you know, you can't put it down to one thing. But in any event, what they are trying to put it down to, the one thing, is just silly. If somebody comes out at 19 as gay and then two or three or four years later expresses regret or an interest in returning to a heterosexual worldview... This act says they can't talk to a therapist about converting back to heterosexuality, or at least that the therapist can't talk to them about it. That's not very wise. I mean, if if it sounds to me more like ideology than like clinical And that's what I was going to say is on one hand, we see this, uh, like a desire to want to help people and and to uh, help the the oppressed. But on the other hand, we seem as long as it fits the ideology that I'm trying to push. That's my fear in this so much. And I think that's one of the why this is so helpful to just be able to talk about. And, and that's why we got to do this. You know me, I'm a bridge builder. I don't want to yeah. talk about anything controversial. I want to make jokes and keep moving. But yeah. like this stuff matters. That's the later part of the episode. <laughs> so there's 23 paragraphs, as I've said. So you get down <laughs> to the very last paragraph, kind of the summation of whoever, you know, whatever congressional intern wrote this stuff, you know, because that's, <laughs> that's who's writing these laws. I shouldn't say things like that. But anyway, well, at paragraph 23, as with, all prohibitions on invidious discrimination. You have to look that up, but it sounds really bad. <laughs> I feel like we got Darth this Sidious was, here. This is written by a Bond villain. <laughs> as, as with all prohibitions, and we're laughing, but we're not laughing at yeah, someone yeah. who's been hurt. But here's the deal. This is not wise. So 23, as with all prohibitions on invidious discrimination, this act furthers the government's compelling interest in the least restrictive way because only by forbidding discrimination is it possible to avert or redress the harms described in this subsection. So it's the last bit of the findings yeah. for why we need this act. And here we find out that until this act passes, discrimination is not illegal. Well, that's just a crock of bull. <laughs> it's only by forbidding it. No, it's, it's already forbidden. 
And there's a million ways, and we'll talk about that in a bit. It's just crazy. Those are huge claims. <laughs> it's just crazy. And I, they're wild. Some of the some of them are wild ones too. And I think you're right. Like we we we're laughing and we're making jokes. It's not at the expense of the people that they're trying mm-hmm. to that supposedly yeah. they're trying to help. It's at the wording and the way that this is being made, and the ideology that I think that this is pushing more than the the heart to actually help people. So, yeah. other than just what I said, what what problems are you seeing in this? Just as you go through it. I mean, I, I'm going to offer a couple, several, yeah. and then we're going to talk about s- some outcomes. Uh, I don't know. I mean, first of all, <laughs> discrimination is not so easily discerned. Hmm. And, and I know that's not nice to say, or it ought to be because we don't want any racism. We don't want any sexism. We don't want any ageism. We don't want any ism yeah. like that. And I get it. But treating people differently before the law and in life based on some factor of their lives, you can hide that. Hmm. And, and so discrimination is just not so easily discerned because anyone can hide a nefarious reasoning when they make a decision and they can get away with it. But here's the, the other side of that coin. Someone else can be accused of nefarious reasoning in their decisions and they can't get away from it. Hmm. And the accusation, it's kind of like I'm, I'm reading Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Like yeah. I'm reading the stories of these people in the concentration camps in the Soviet Union. And his, you know, he goes through each step of the way of being arrested and interrogated and on the trains and in the camps and all these things. And he's like, the interrogation, that's just because the accusation's been made. The only point of the interrogation is to get you to admit to whatever they've accused you of. Hmm. It's not to see if you should have a court case. There's no court case. <laughs> I mean, and that's the problem. And I'm not saying with this act, I'm saying in our world today, yeah. if someone is accused of an ism, you can't get out of that accusation. Yeah. So it's hard to prove, but it's also hard to prove innocence. And so this, this becomes a slippery slope and a very difficult thing. And, and I'm not saying we shouldn't tackle it. I'm saying we should tackle it with a lot more wisdom than I saw in those first 23 paragraphs. I agree. So that's one thing. Another problem I have, and, and by far the bigger problem than just that it's hard to discern discrimination. The Equality Act, I think, misuses and diminishes the Civil Rights Act. So mm. if I can step back and talk a little bit about the Civil Rights Act and then yeah. lead us to what the Equality Act is saying, you can make a really, really good case why in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was needed. Okay, you can make a really <laughs> yeah. good case. And, and let's make that case just for a minute. Yeah. Again, I'm a Canadian, so maybe I have this wrong. But I'm, I'm a thinker, and, I, and I, I love this. Look, the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution enumerates rights that each individual possesses in our country, each citizen before our laws. And the problem prior to 1964 is that African Americans had never had access to all of the protections of the Bill of Rights across the country. And so the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was needed because it had to correct egregious wrongs in our history. Kind of what some people have said, the birth defect of America, Hmm. how it treated African Americans. And I think that's right. From slavery, then Uh, Reconstruction, Jim Crow laws, segregation, all this kind of stuff. Things were botched so badly on this score from the writing of the Bill of Rights. You can go back to, you know, uh, the Declaration of Independence, whatever, all the way till 1964 or all the way till uh, the Civil Rights Act. It was necessary to codify in a special way the way each individual citizen was to be treated in this group that had been so horribly mistreated. Now, the Bill of Rights stands and it still treats us all equally before the law. There was one group that had never been treated equally before the law, uh, African Americans. And so the Civil Rights Act of 1964 righted a wrong as it laid out plainly the myriad ways that African Americans were being demeaned in our country and listed ways that they could no longer be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Hotels, restaurants, restrooms, water fountains, all these things and more. And in doing so, the Civil Rights Act plainly lays out the failure of our people, of our society, of our culture, of our laws to uphold the basic rights of these millions of citizens. I actually think the benefit of the Civil Rights Act was needed and and 
and was a blessing and a huge healing in our country's history. Now, we're not in heaven yet, so nothing ever acts perfectly, but that was a wonderful thing. So why shouldn't we apply this to the LGBTQ community? Like, who wouldn't want to extend then to another oppressed group the benefits of the Civil Rights Act? Well, I think it's because they're not being discriminated against with anything near the egregious level of wrongs that every African American endured Hmm. in our nation's history. I'm not denying that there are times of real discomfort by members of the LGBTQ community. I'm not saying that there are not real instances of wrongs done and injustices done to someone because they're gay or because they're trans. And where those instances occur, I'm not saying it's okay for them to occur. It's not. As humans, we have to treat each other equally, and the Bill of Rights does that. But to say that this journey is the same as the journey that slaves and Jim Crow and segregation pushed on African Americans, and thus we need to be a special group with special protections, I just don't think that's good. Hmm. So here's the reality. While there are instances of wrongs done to individual trans or gay people, there's no systemic or nationwide discrimination against them, as there was for every black person in North Carolina, yeah. for instance, because that's where we are. Yeah. Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple. I mean, I'm using an Apple laptop. <laughs> I got an Apple phone. I'm thinking last night, I got to get an Apple watch. You know, I mean, I got Apple stock. I hope I have Apple stock. I don't know. You got to bolster anyway. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. But Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple, probably one of the five most valuable companies in the world. He's a gay man. He came out publicly. This is part of his story. He is a fantastic leader of one of the world's great companies. You can't say his journey is the same as a black man on a road in 1957 at night with a group of white men following him in the country in Georgia. You cannot say that's the same thing. There is no systemic discrimination. I'm not saying there's no instances of it. But the Civil Rights Act carved out a special group that we need to redress the wrongs that were done to them to correct the whole structure of society. So I would say that to take the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and to include a new group of oppressed people now, all gay and lesbian people and trans, and oh, by the woman, what, by the way, every woman in America, now you're talking about 50, 60% of the country for more protection than the population. I, It's to diminish the uniqueness and the Mm. beauty of what happened in the battle for civil rights 50 years ago. I mean, that's, you know, I notice you're quiet, so I'll just keep going. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Maybe you don't want to go on record. I don't know. I just think that's true. The other thing about the Civil Rights Act is this. It came about not by force, but by suffering. Yeah, and that seems vastly different than what this is trying to say. I mean, generations of suffering by the African-American community and decades or at least 10 or 15 or so years of active civil disobedience Mm. by the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr. and others that he mobilized, the legislation came about because hearts were awakened and consciences were changed. Mm. And heart change leads to law change. Yeah, and we often try to go the opposite route, I think, where we go law, we, let's, let's implement the law to implement heart change. Yeah. But, you know, as every parent finds out with their own kids, that rarely ever works, if it ever works. Yeah. As I find every Sunday night with our students, it <laughs> just doesn't work that way. But man, when, when someone, when their heart is just, when they catch on to it, when that fire is burning their heart, like then, then they're, they're wholesale bought in yeah. on those laws. Like it, yeah. it's That's vastly right. different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me go on because uh, I know the time is going here and we want to keep sort of honoring folks. But um, look, if you're another problem I have is the rationale is not unassailable. Like if you're going to pass nationwide sweeping legislation, you need to have the broadest buy in what you were just talking about. And otherwise, you sow discord and you weaken the structure of a culture. If you try to squeeze something through that's that's binding on everyone and, and partisan and to say Like we've already touched on this. The case is just not as strong Mm. as the acts promoters want to say. So um, Freedom for All Americans, a pro-trans website uh, that is active politically, Freedom for All Americans, they say this, 21 states already have non-discrimination legislation. It's already on the books in 21 states. 
90% of Fortune 500 companies also have non-description, non-discrimination policies. I guess the point here is that we're not talking about inaccessibility to voting, redlining communities, you yeah. know, two types of drinking fountains. We're not talking about that. What we're seeing in 21 states, 90% of companies, uh, Fortune 500, we're seeing federalism and the free market play out. States move at different speeds and respond in different ways. And we're seeing that played out. And companies do what's in their best interest to retain their best employees. Hmm. And it's working. They're making the, law, uh, the policies in their companies. So the rationale for a national legislation that's going to upend so many things because there's, a, there's this egregious and incorrigible problem must be addressed now. I think they're overstating their case by a long shot, and I think they're aiming for way more than they need to. There's just not widespread, systemic, inescapable oppression of the LGBTQ community. And again, it doesn't mean there's not hurts. All right, so I think and the question then is, will this, this sweeping national legislation, will it undo those hurts? Like, uh, <laughs> and so what are the outcomes of this? Well, that's interesting. Will it undo those hurts? That's the question, because that's yeah. a heart thing, not a law thing, but that goes back to the heart and law. What are some of the outcomes? Okay, well, um, will it really heal the hearts? Will it mean that hearts are changed? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it may promise too much to the LGBTQ community that says now there will never be another instance of discrimination. It might promise too much to them. Hmm. Although now there's another tool to fight discrimination. But again, I already think there's enough tools in the toolbox with the Bill of Rights. Now, I could be wrong on that, but it just seems that. But I also think it's going to harden hearts. Instead of building bridges to someone hmm. who's on the fence or unsure, it's cudgeoning them, uh, bludgeoning them, I think, uh, into saying, no, you've got to do this. And it's not going to draw someone who's maybe not thinking about the hurts of the LGBTQ community. It's just not going to draw them. Yeah, um, I think different outcomes you can see in different parts of the community. I mean, we can move away from that to what are the unintended consequences or what are the spillover effects? I mean, if you can't, disc I mean, and these are, you know, we've heard these before. They're worth stating again. We don't have to dwell on them because they're true and they're self-evident and they're common sense. But look, if you can't discriminate based on gender identity, then we're seeing it in Connecticut already. Biologically yeah. born boys in high school are competing in girls' sports because they're self-identifying. Well, that's fine, but I don't know where the feminists are. And maybe they're out there because I'm not on the oh, mailing list, but like, you know. They're out there and they're going off about it too. And, and for good are. reason, man. Yeah, they are. I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's almost undoing all the like generations a century of work of, yeah, on this. Yeah, I, I exactly think that. So yeah, and it, it's very sad if you have a daughter who, Anyway, you know, we can, yeah. I, I think modesty and safety in public places where, um, you know, different locker rooms, different bathrooms, and now it's all mixed up and muddled. I mean, you know, as a dad who's kind of, his, his daughter's too old to go in the men's room with him, or maybe he never did, I don't know, but now she goes in on yeah. her own. I, I mean, but she's still young. Like, you just want as much protection and care as you can. And look, I'm just saying that as a dad and a citizen, like... I think every thoughtful person, like I, I think a Muslim mom doesn't want to go into a restroom where you just don't know who's in there. Like I think, you know, I, I mean, adoption, yeah. let's go on to adoption. I mean, how can a Christian adoption agency who believes in a marriage, not just a sexual stereotype, but a marriage between a man and a woman, how can they be forced to place children in a home with two married men or two married women? I mean, we want kids placed in homes. There's no doubt about it. But why would you want to deny the conscience of all these groups who are already placing children in homes? It just seems like it's going to be overreach there. Mm -hmm. And then even think of, you know, Christian ministries or Christian schools or all this. Um, I mean, just think of one case. Like if, if an applicant is gay and you don't hire them, because maybe there's another applicant more qualified you're open to being sued for discriminatory hiring practices. And mm. even if you win the case, it costs you time and money and it takes you off and you might lose the case. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, those are just a few outcomes that uh, just sideways, like it's just not wise. Yeah, there seems to be a, like clearly just this Pandora's box of outcomes and possibilities that could come from this and none of them seem to be good. So yeah. here's the question. 
very practical. How do we respond? And I'll answer first. Okay. Because uh, it's the one way that I always have to lean on and fall into. And it's one not to panic because yeah, of a simple reason. God is on his throne. Yeah. Like true. I have, look, I get a little worried. I, I get mixed up. I get a little confused when it comes to politics and all things, economics and social. That's why I, I always have to interview the, you on these. <laughs> but the one remind, one thing I always come back to is God is on his throne. Christ is king, whether this passes or not. Right. He is Lord Absolutely. and he is sovereign. Yep. We don't have to panic in this, no matter the decision. Yeah, and God is on his throne and sometimes we suffer. Ooh. That's the message of the book of Revelation. Come God on. wins, we suffer. So we yep. may have to suffer. It's okay. It's all part of his calling. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean we want it. Yeah, yeah. And we live in an open political system. So what's another way that we can do to respond? Well, I think you can engage publicly. Call your senator, call your congressman, state representatives, governors. Be involved in, like maybe you're drawn to Democratic Party politics, Republican Party politics. Join in and jump in and be involved. You know, mm. <laughs> if you leave the, uh, the, the forming of platforms to strangers, I mean, you get what you deserve. So there's a lot of Christians who want to be involved in these parties. Do it. Go for it. I think social media and conversations engage there too. Be winsome, be gentle, be clear, be compassionate, but speak the truth in love. Hmm. Nothing is helped when truth is not out there and nothing is helped when love is not out there. Yeah. So truth and love, truth and yep. love, truth and love, which makes it hard on social media. I guarantee you there's oh, very gosh. few threads that are all truth and love, but whatever. There's a whole lot of threads that have neither too. Yeah, that's right. And a whole lot of Christians in those. And <laughs> you know, guys, let's just, let's just represent the Lord Jesus, which does not mean rolling over. It just means speaking the truth in love. Jesus never just rolled over. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, there was a, a guy emigrated to the U.S. from the Ukraine, so former Soviet Union, back in 2000. His name is Vladimir Grigorenko, and he uh, is in Rod Dreher's book called Live Not By Lies. And, and he, he talks about Americans are increasingly intolerant of dissenting opinions. And this was the line that I thought was so good, and I don't know if it's Grig Grigorenko's or Dreher's, but uh, reflecting on this as we're increasingly intolerant of dissenting opinions and we don't want to say anything, and here it is. He sees this as a sign that society prefers the false peace of conformity to the tensions of liberty. Hmm. The false peace of conformity. Just don't say anything. Just keep your voice down. Yeah. To the tensions of liberty. I mean, it's true. When people are free, there's tension. We're not all on the same page at every time. And sometimes I get, you know, a little bit false peace. Now, yeah. there's also intolerance that's pushing down on us. Mm. And, and that may try, which actually the data is be more strong truth in love. Speak earlier and clearer with love about truth. Man. And, uh, and the data is that actually gets you farther than waiting until it's Really? That's speak. a great word to just yeah. hear. It's yeah. good for my own heart just to know that. As and, someone who constantly just wants to like wait until it's all out there and then I can know all the things and then respond. Right. Uh, it's just good to know there there's, might be a better way. There might be a better way. And, and I think you want to be, um, I think it helps if you can have a wink and a smile about it, like which is yeah. hard to do on a thread. Yeah, on, I, uh, I put ex <laughs> lots of exclamation points. Yeah. <laughs> but it does. And then, you know, not just social media, but folks around you. Yeah. Engage friends and neighbors, especially those who may have been discriminated against or who are part of the LGBTQ mm. community. I mean, we are God's hands and feet on earth. So move towards them in love and care. Definitely yeah. not as a project, but because they are in God's image. God loves them. He's still unfolding the story of their lives like he's still unfolding the story of my life. Mm. Pray for them and be with them and love them and what and become friends with them and you'll be enriched as well. Yep. <laughs> but I think that's just another way we, we need actively to pursue friends who don't just look or think like us, but also in this time with the Equality Act, let's pursue those who really probably think differently than hmm. us and lean in and see how they might never have talked to someone like you who thinks the Equality Act might not be the best thing. Yeah. Man, Jason, thank you so much just for being willing to, to be here and talk about this. This is a lot of work, a lot of time, and just a lot of wisdom, I think. So thank you. I definitely feel better about it. I hope you guys yeah. do as well. Thank you for listening or watching. Please like and subscribe this video, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks.
This is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Visit gracekinston.org or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.